Well, there's plenty of time for um, question and answer, so um, Um, because I don't think students have good metacognition. <laughs> I don't think they're aware of how much they learn. That's why I was just going with um, a, a quantitative assessment. Um, I've been trying to teach my students better metacognition. Actually, being at this conference has kind of inspired me some ideas about how to do that. Um, but um, they, they are very ignorant of these things. Follow up on that. I'm curious about the faculty. It like, seemed like there was a question that came from faculty. I was curious like, if you guys have seen the questions in the Nessie form. Some of those questions mm -hmm. kind of train the students on that metacognition a little better. Instead mm -hmm. of just asking how much did you learn, they ask specifically about like, did you, what kinds of learning did you experience in the class? How many times were you asked to synthesize material? How many times were you asked to, how many times did you change your mind because something that mm -hmm. Has anyone else used that? Um, and I know we use the Nessie when the students come in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, we follow that, whatever, what is it, a three year pattern? Uh, something like that. So I know that we do that. So we might see if we could, I don't know, they aggregate that data. So we wouldn't be able yeah, to. Yeah, it would be hard to match yeah. it with the students. It was it, We even wanted to get student evals, too, might reveal more of that kind of subjective stuff, too, but um, we were denied. Right, and we're only going to be able to get that aggregate, but I really wish that we could have um, been able to take that, uh, the eval, because we do get at those questions on our evals, mm -hmm. or teaching evals. So it's going to be really interesting for me to see the difference between my traditional and my uh, blended mm -hmm. on the evals as far as how they felt challenged, or you know, that kind of thing. I'm really looking forward to that, and it was very disappointing, but I mean, I totally get why we, we can't, but we don't only get eval aggregate. You know, mm -hmm. even if we agreed yeah. not to look at it and it just went to the lead researcher, no, they would not, the school would not give us permission to take that individually and look at it against yeah. the But those qualitative comments they write in, too, might be, I mean, that's a great um, kind of qualitative study. And with all the faculty who are doing this study, we are also, Jean headed up having them write weekly, um, prompts and, and talk about how they feel in the process more. Right. So we did a, an um, auto-ethnography um, type thing and uh, because some of the faculty weren't real comfortable with just doing narratives of themselves and uh, so we set it up as a prompt system. So we did a very lengthy pre-design prompt and then as you designed your course we had a weekly prompt. And, and a lot of those weekly prompts were like, so share two of your best ideas this week with another faculty member, you know, to, to get them to be thinking about kind of qualitatively what, what they, how they felt about things. And then at the end of the design period, there was a lengthy prompt. And uh, pre-teaching, um, there was a lengthy prompt about how we felt about our students. Things were, um, that was really interesting because like, for example, my concern was community in the classroom. Like, I really like, I know all my students' names, and I get them internships, and, and the statistics professor was like, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's going to be really interesting because of this interdis you know, kind of cross-disciplinary kind of focus. And then we did a post-teaching, very lengthy talk, but every week we would go in to, we just are using Google Docs um, to kind of set this study up, and we would, answer five questions um, about it. So, I mean, and we have students right now, thanks to student workers, yay, yay. Yeah. <laughs> because that was going to be a daunting task this summer. We all looked at each other like, what did we say we would do last mm -hmm. summer? Um, but, uh, so the students are going to code that. We gave them permission. We asked each of the faculty member if we would, and that was kind of like, oh, we want students to be reading about how we're feeling about teaching students as we're going on. Mm -hmm. So you need to kind of think about that. I mean, it would have been, Best if we had like graduate students or right. something, but we didn't. We don't, don't we have don't, access yeah. in our situation. So, um, so we gave students permission mm -hmm. to code that data this summer, and we're hoping to, you know, take a look at it and see. It should be really interesting, just um, from what professors go through as they try to transition, because none of us had taught a blended course before, so this is all new. So it'll be kind of a glimpse at how we transition through that. Um, I have a question for you and also our first speaker. So uh, to Cynthia and 
to you. You guys did a great job. Interesting study. Uh, I know your goal wasn't to look at individual faculty, but mm -hmm. did, I'm sure you ran those tests. Yeah, yeah. So again, but these are small class sizes, so nothing was significant. Chad probably came the closest. He's our bio guy. Now, once we add in Teresa, we had two bio, right? And they were very similar. So it was like 122 and 121. So we're hoping once we add Teresa's data in, she had a lot more students with Chad's. Um, we're hoping that that might actually be um, significant, mm -hmm. and especially because a lot of this is. Uh, very ramped up and, and advertised in the STEM fields. Yeah, so, well done. Yeah. My question to you is, uh, um, anecdotally, uh, even as an administrator in an academic setting, I can, I was well aware that there was not a lot of acceptance for online training for extended learning in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, and so that might impact the number of interruptions because a coworker sees you, she's not doing anything, but you know, staring at her screen. Do you have any sense of I that being there? Not. People just don't take online learning seriously. Basically, is that, is that what you're saying? Well, Coworkers specifically training, don't. Specifically, HR sort of personnel, mm -hmm. that kind of training? Any kind of online training if someone sees you staring into a screen uh, there's the tendency to that's an interruptible moment whereas if you're in conversation mm -hmm. or on a device that's not so interruptible mm -hmm. yeah you, that's you know a great question and i guess that that comes to the point of like if you know that you're in that position are you managing your work environment so that you continue to get interrupted and and that's why there's certain organizations that are great about this, like IBM has a really strong, a strict policy about allowing um, people to just put a sign up and say, don't disturb me because I'm in e-learning training. Mm -hmm. um, most organizations don't give that kind mm -hmm. of Head headphones. They get to assume that you're supposed to take your work home with you anytime, anywhere kind of training, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it really puts a huge burden on learners because, like you were saying, even adults don't really have a true, like, metacognitive sense of, you know, we all assume that we're getting it, you know, we're not, like, continuously testing ourselves like we're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, it's just, that's why it's study self-regulation, yeah. you know. I have a question for both of the implementing people is, as, as you're evaluating the student learning and faculty satisfaction, how are you tracking workload? Right, whether especially if you've got a model of, of a traditional and a blended classroom that you're offering in the same semester, how are you testing how that changes what faculty are doing and how much time they're doing on different kinds of tasks? Yeah, so the faculty or the students? Faculty. Well, this is changing the way we work and how we work and how much we work and where we work and how are we knowing that? Yeah. Um, for us, we did um, like a, a course design map with Carnegie hours, and we were trying to be very to stick with that, make sure the students had the exact right number of, you know, instructor-led and student-led hours. So that was our kind of solution. But that, that's not but your workload. No. You're asking, oh, I'll, I'll yeah. tell you right now, yeah. our autoethnographies, it's way more work. Yeah. It's way more oh, for the lab, for the faculty, not for the students. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. now with hours, I think the ACL alone yeah. is like, more prep work than mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah way more prep work um, and now we anticipate that being ongoing or a so, startup cost well i think part of uh, well it's hard to say because i've only done it once yeah. so um, <laughs> but i would assume that next time around but here's the problem i want to change a lot yeah. now that i've done yeah. it yeah. And, you know one of the ctl um, minion he was funny he said you know his, his experience was like it's like having a child you know, the first time around, you're really nervous, and you're looking everything up, and you know, and the, after you have your second one, it's kind of like been there, done that, and I know that doesn't work, so I'm going to do it this way, or just shift and whatever, and I thought that was a good um, way to look at it, because I definitely want to change things. Now, that's going to cost me some time this summer um, that I hadn't really anticipated, but, so I don't know if you ever get out of that loop. But in terms of assessment, as these things are being scaled up, thinking about not just what students are learning, but how mm -hmm. faculty workload yeah. is changing seems to be an important thing yeah. to us. We so got a small stipend for the design, and we got to keep up the rights to our course. 
which was important. I said I would not participate in the study if that was not a, yeah. so, so we got to keep our own rights and, and, and we got a small stipend. Yeah, certainly for me the work was divided into two phases and uh, the development of the online material was like 99% of, of, of the work. Um, the great motivation is for me was the seeding increase in enrollment. So we were able to, op to offer an intensive course that normally had five face-to-face -face meeting or three face-to-face uh, -face meeting a week and that allowed more students to enroll. So that is the great motivation. We're a small department like you know many of you are, so it's really the intensive courses that were bread and butter. And then there's the whole other phase of uh, um, using this online material in class, so in blended learning, which means that you have to design activities to fill in that time that you have mm -hmm. now at your disposal. And, uh, and again, yes, time consuming, but also rewarding because um, I was able to uh, infuse much more uh, cultural themes in my beginning uh, intensive class than I was previously. And uh, I don't know if this was the motivation for the high retention rate, but I uh, assume it, it was. Uh, out of the uh, 15 students who started, 13 continued, which is pretty high retention rate. Uh, certainly in their evaluations, they mentioned that they enjoyed learning more Itali about Italian culture. So that's another big piece of uh, motivation for faculty to want to get themselves into this enterprise. But I agree. It was too, it's so easy for us to get up and lecture. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a professor too, so I can just stand up there, especially if you're taught the course a couple times. I can just shoot off my lecture. I got my PowerPoint. It takes me no time. The, it's the activity, developing good activities in class, and that you never feel like, well, that went well, what can I do better? Whereas a lecture kind of plateaus pretty quickly. You're like, I got everything I want to you know, talk about in, so it's not a big deal. So, yeah, you know, it's a huge amount of time. They, uh, the students did, did say in all the surveys that we have taken <laughs> that it does take a lot more time. And some of them even said, uh, it's not like with your study where you keep all the variables pretty, mm -hmm. pretty tight. But in our courses, like the courses, the students do say all of them in mm -hmm. all of the courses that, uh, like the digital scholarship project, one of them did a digital scholarship project, uh, and so on and so forth. They did spend a lot more time at a cost because what they would do is they would do less of the readings, mm -hmm. and so it's just that even though they were spending more time, there is something that gets lost because. Yeah. Uh, Time is limited, and we can. I'm, I'm not going to email you. I would say she's been waiting to ask a question. Oh, um, did you consider looking at gaining knowledge over the course instead of just our final grades? And also, what are your thoughts on um, that blended may be most helpful for, for the weaker students? All right. I mean, then there's a lot of, especially for the hard sciences, there's some really good metrics that they can ask. They've got some actually established questionnaires and things like that for students who, like, for example, haven't taken um, a physics course before, and you can ask them things like, when a larger car hits a smaller car, what do you think happens to the smaller car? That is in plain language, and then after they take that course, then you give them the same exam again. Um, that really kind of gets at learning. I looked into it, but it'd be so hard to find that equivalent for all the different courses. So what we try to do is, again, tie it to those learning outcomes, to try to tie the assessments to the learning outcomes to kind of get around that. But uh, I mean, if, I think that's a very larger question is like, how are we assessing how the students learn? <laughs> I think that's nothing, that's definitely nothing that I've solved. So. <laughs> So wouldn't that be where you could use a more general education assessment or something like that on some of these courses that are that are taught to a lot of the same assessment strategy? Um, so we have all of our general education objectives, all of our learning outcomes that we want from general education as a whole. That seems to be a good pot that would use similar outcomes, similar assessments um, for those kind of cross-disciplinary sources that would allow you to make those so comparisons. Is, that, is it like more like critical thinking questions? So critical thinking, mm -hmm. writing, yeah, quantitative. Reading, so some of those that are going to be present in all of those general education courses at, at some extent you use your baselines and, and that would give you that difference score that would 
allow you to make more inferences. Yeah, that would have been very awesome. Um, how about you, Anthony? Um, this is for uh, Daniela and Veronica. Yes. Uh, have any other language programs at Wellesley done blended courses or something as uh, you know well developed as uh, you've done? No, not that I know. No. There's a couple others underway. Yes. There are languages. Spanish. Spanish. Chinese. Spanish. Chinese. Wow. Spanish. Well, Spanish has done a little bit of blended. Uh, but in a different way, it's not all online. Um, so what they have done, and they have used some features of blended learning, but not as as complete as. Uh, are learning. you working with them at all? Or yes, we are. As a matter of fact, fact, yes. But with the same intent of reducing the number of face-to-face -face hours, or but we don't there? reduce the number of face-to-face -face hours. I, I did. You, you did. You did. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And MIT now. Oh, no. Also the MIT. Okay. Yeah. Um, because I think that across the board is one of the challenges we have, particularly with intensive language courses. Yeah. yeah. That is done as per. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's it. that is done experimentally by the college. In fact, we had to. I had to be approved by the Committee on Cultural on um, uh, Curriculum, and it was approved uh, um, experimentally for the fall. It has been uh, approved again for next year. Um, but it's the, the number of content hours is um, really decided by the college and the uh, amount of credit given to the students depends on the content hours. So it's a, I think it's a decision that they have to bring to academic council. It's, um, it's not in our hands. Yeah. Um, I had a question actually about the interruptions um, because I, I know that uh, students uh, think of interruptions as a good thing. Yeah. And, I, and, and to some extent, I agree with them. I don't have any uh, research backing for this, but I do feel like there's a time when I get to a point in my task where I cannot concentrate on it anymore, and that I could keep doing it, but it wouldn't be productive, and that an interruption is a wonderful thing. I disagree with the students somewhat on the level and frequency of interruptions. <laughs> but, but I think that they find that you know one of the good things about the blended course with online videos is that when they lose concentration, they can come back to exactly to the same point instead of missing 15 minutes of lectures. There's, yeah, yeah. So I have one study where I found that it was in the middle of training where they actually did the best when I interrupted them. So I, I, I have a bunch of studies that are really extensive, and it was, and it, what it does is it wakes them up, right? Mm -hmm. Also, we know that interruptions, especially when you're working on very simple tasks, interruptions facilitate the speed at which you're working at. So it has like um, sort of an arousal effect, like Rick Scott's in principle, like <laughs> having enough stress actually facilitates your performance mm -hmm. on tasks. Um, and also creativity, this is really interesting, is that interruptions actually improve your creativity. Even though that's different from learning, mm -hmm. it does have some actual benefits for you know, cognitive activities. So interruptions can be beneficial. I didn't get into it. For the most part, the way I study it, interruptions are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, there are definitely benefits, and it's really interesting that you say that because it's, it's true. There's certain parts of training. You don't want to interrupt at the beginning of training. It's in the middle. When people are starting to feel like, I need something different to think about, and it, it really it opens you up. I think it also requires, I think it, it, it sort of creates a testing effect too, where you have to think, what was I just learning about? Right. Right. It gets into the metacognitive. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'd like to get back to the question of uh, how we know what people are learning and how faculty members uh, teaching courses figure out what they want students to learn. Uh, we have a grant from the Mellon Foundation to support um, eight or nine projects a year over three or four years uh, at the five colleges in Western Mass. And uh, we have support from Teagle to, uh, to, to hire someone, which we've done, to work with individual faculty on establishing assessment programs for particular courses. And I'm wondering if anyone in the room or you all who are thinking about this in a focused way have any examples of, of uh, uh, that kind of development of um, assessment tools that, that are intensively engaging individual faculty members for particular courses in the liberal arts rather than large gen ed courses or you know, global global goals and what would advise us to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a specifics, but I mean I'd love to hear that from the audience too if you've got any 
uh, at Haverford, and, and this is true for the Trago, we uh, also a team of funded uh, projects to develop um, rubrics and uh, learning outcomes for specific departments uh, across the four-year plan, and then uh, on the level of the individual course, it's fine. I mean, does anyone know the student learning outcome literature really well? I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm like familiar with the broad strokes, but um, I think that is a massive concern where everyone's like, okay, we now know we're supposed to do these student learning outcomes. What is the evidence that these things actually work? And if students are even aware of them. I mean, I know we put them in the syllabus and I tell them the first day and I remind them like 80 times, but are they still aware, are they aware of them? <laughs> Well, and also you have to um, look at, are your assessments connected to those learning outcomes? Are you actually yeah. testing yeah. whether or not they learned that? Or are you testing something right. different? Right. So all that has to be aligned. I mean, that's kind of the basic. That's what we do when we do our course design map. The first thing you do is you have your topic. Then you have whatever the reading or how to end the lecture. And then you align that with how you're assessing it. And that's aligned with the actual learning outcome. So we make sure that that all lines up week by week everything that they're reading they should be should be you know should be based on that um, uh, on that objective and then the assessment should be based on the reading and the objective and you know and the, and the assignments any practice they do so at least we do that alignment and we do know for the literature that that's um, more successful than you know having no objectives and just throwing stuff at the wall and then then add some questions that are unrelated. Um, but I don't know if there's even a, a better way. Um, I don't know of it. The way that uh, we've been doing it, uh, you know, in various groups that I've worked with, it helps, I think, to start with the objectives. Mm -hmm. And that's also, that's frankly, I mean, for me as a faculty, but also for people that I work with, that's often the hardest thing is to say, well, what what is it that I actually want to know? And for me, it was always very easy to say, skill building types of, you know, within my discipline or just generally, you know, writing skills, things like that, when it got to content, you know, what do I really want them to get out of this history survey course, huh? You know, that, that was a little bit harder, but, but thinking about that, and then I found actually thinking about what it would take, where my students come in, what will it take to get them from where they are to where they need to go, and how am I going to assess those two things? Yeah, the you know, that's kind of the thinking that I do. And then I start thinking about, okay, what are the readings? What are the whatevers? What are, you know, but it's a really different way of thinking about designing a course. It's been very, and, and that's one of the biggest things I think I've learned about working on some of this blended stuff, because mm -hmm. you do think a little yes. bit more methodically about it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely changed the way I would design any course, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone, I use OLI, I don't know if anybody has used that, the Open Learning Initiative stuff. Yeah. And uh, even if you don't aren't interested in using it, it's good to go and look at it and look at one of the courses in your discipline because they're all over it in terms of learning objectives and linking them to analytics and the metacognitive stuff. Yes. Yeah. Students see all of that. Right. And and they, and I think we were talking about process earlier in one of the sessions. They walk in one of the intro units, and you can modify OLI now. It used to be you had to just take it wholesale, but you can modify and create. But they have an early unit that walks students through. Here's what a learning objective is. Here's what the analytics are going to tell you. It's really very nice. Um, mm -hmm. Again, they can get a little overwrought. I mean, I do biochem, and it's like, oh, you know, the learning mm -hmm. objective is very serious very quickly. Mm -hmm. But it can be helpful to see as one mm -hmm. end of it. Kind of ripping off of that, one of the things we found in when we were surveying students around the first round of blended courses that we did at Bryn Mawr was it was so essential to the students that the instructor had linked whatever it was that they were doing, having them do a quiz, having them do online you know, self-reflections, we had someone who was doing sort of metacognitive quizzes or whatever, that they explained why the students were doing it and that they sort of explained how they thought, at least the instructor thought, it would help you know, them learn the material. Because without that, sometimes they felt like it was just some sort of weird thing that they were being asked, right? If, if they could see sort of how at least you thought it was gonna work, and maybe it won't work the way I thought it was, but here's what I'm trying to do, you know? It seemed like uh, communicating not only the learning outcomes, but how each piece sort of connected to your learning outcomes really, really helped in terms of student satisfaction um, and also in terms of that kind of developing the metacognition, getting it, you know, what it is I'm trying to do here. That's helpful. Okay. Comments on your comments? 
<laughs> um, two things that came out of the experience. One is just what you said, that revisiting your course in a new design, you know, in a newly designed way, mm -hmm. so helpful for uh, for the professors, I think. Mm -hmm. And all of us have said like, oh wow, we're changing stuff in our face place classes because of what we've learned in London. That's really, and then the other thing that I really feel very strongly about is that, you know, students need to learn more when they get out, not less. You know, their ending doesn't stop, it actually just kind of begins. And so this self-directed learner, I kept I think is so important that we teach our students to be self-directed learners. And by kind of making that obvious to them as they go through the course, mm -hmm. I think it, give it, it power, empowers them yes. to see that they're controlled, I'm not in control, they're mm -hmm. in control. I think that was really helpful. So even though it took me a longer time, I think we're adding a new student outcome. And mm -hmm. that is by really modeling self-directed learning before they get out and have to do it on their own. Um, we probably have time for one more question. I know I was going back to your question about institutionally how to start measuring some of these things. We had a Teagle, I'm from St. Lawrence University in upstate New York, and we had a Teagle grant a few years ago about diversity learning. We spent four years on that grant, right? Um, just doing syllabus mapping, doing all kinds of stuff, pre and post tests. We had people come in and design courses and do assessments of individual courses at the end. We had all sorts of stuff. I gotta be honest, it's, it's hard, especially, I think, we have smallish goals in individual courses about content that we want students to learn, but we're also interested in big learning that happens over a long time. And then if you're t talking about even critical thinking or attitudinal changes and things like that, those can go a step back, right? Diversity learning, we notice a lot of students after their first diversity course actually took a step back <laughs> in, in tolerance and, being, and emotional engagement with difference and all of that stuff and stuff. I mean, one thing to look it's at. tough to, um, to figure out, well, what are you going to do with assessment? What does it mean? How is it useful? Yeah. All of that Especially that hard. application, I think, to the discipline I've struggled with. And one thing that's interesting, and I don't know if this is um, the American, I happen to be trained as a historian, so I happen to know this, but um, the American Historical so Association is doing something called tuning. Yeah. Where they're We're trying to, yeah, okay. Where they're trying to kind of, they're kind of grappling with this question. I think as a discipline, which I think was very helpful for me, and I don't know if you know we can slowly sort of nudge our disciplines into into doing that. At least having that conversation, having that conversation with other historians, so I can kind of figure out. Oh, okay, yes, yes, yes. You know, right, you've tried yeah. this, or right. I think that would be super, super helpful, and I think that would help a bit with. I think a lot of us institutionally are thinking about these things and how, what are the big picture learning goals, and I think it would help if the discipline sort of helped us map on the small picture goals to those. You know, mm -hmm. that that maybe is something that's missing. Just quickly following up on that, that my other, I also uh, am part of the Five College Women's Learning Program. And what I'm seeing in, in a variety of projects that we're de developing is that some of the learning outcomes that women's learning produces are different from those learning outcomes that we try to assess. Mm. <laughs> yes. And, and for yes. me, that is a challenge, obviously, for you, but it's also a great opportunity, and that's where the potential of blended learning is. For example, I blended a component of my class uh, last, last fall, and uh, what I saw is like this collaborative generation of knowledge that I had never had in my class before, you know, by using you know, like discussion forums in a certain way, and combined with face-to-face -face presentations and discussions, etc. I had never done that model before, and it really created something new. And I wasn't assessing that because I, wouldn't, I wasn't expecting it. Right. So I'm wondering what it is that we can do to every time we do this one of these uh, studies, uh, you know, can we add variables or factors or outcomes that are not even there yet, yeah, you right, know, right, that right, we right. don't know about yet, yeah. and that's what Blender learning really can, can can help us like figure out. It's like as we move in that direction, new things are happening. And we need to be able to capture that, not just use traditional grading yeah. systems and traditional track, you know, like measuring uh, factors, uh, because that's not going to capture the whole of the experience. Can I just comment on that? I mean, I've done blended classes for about two and a half years, and I always like open ended questions, and one of the words that I didn't expect to come up was confidence. I teach yeah. stats. <laughs> <laughs> 
and they thought, and I was so surprised that they kept saying they felt confident about their knowledge, which I didn't measure ever. And now the next time I see them, they're going to be measuring how confident they are because I had no idea. And the idea of self to it is more real. Right. That's why I had you measure. Well, thanks to all the presenters.